All right. We are here again for another great interview. Ladies and gentlemen, it's good to be back. I have a special guest with me. You might have seen the last interview that I did. Um, it's doing pretty good on, on YouTube. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, leaving messages, lots of thumbs up and stuff. But we have a different reason why we're here. And before we get really started into it, I just want to say we're we're kind of up in the game a little bit. We've got some things that we've been going through. And not only is this going to be on YouTube, but also we're on Spotify now. Peggy Perspective has a bunch of episodes on there uh, that I've done over the last few weeks. So if you're watching this on uh, YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. Tell me how you think about the channel. And for everybody that's listening and uh, driving to work with the podcast going from Spotify, I appreciate you guys very, very much. Also, uh, before we get started, I also encourage you to, uh, if you'd like to help me in these endeavors, whether it's getting the channel going or keeping the podcast going with lots more subject matter, more interviews and all kinds of things. Matter of fact, we've got a podcast that I'm going to be working on. Uh, dealing with the golden dawn here pretty soon so we've got a lot of stuff coming up but uh, I encourage you to also go and be a part of our patreon go to www.patreon forward slash a pagan perspective and we've got a lot of stuff going on there that you can help to uh, get this thing going a little bit better um, my computer's been acting like it wanted to die the last couple of days and I almost didn't get to do this interview the gods love me and they love my computer too so here we are and uh tonight it, it like i said it is my pleasure to have author priest magician man of the world Alaric albertson good to have you here thank you awesome and like we know we've got eric has been writing uh books for many years now and also before i forget we're going to be doing something else, and this is not necessarily going to be for a podcast, but recently I acquired this, the Martin Rune deck, which had a little hoop de tube there for a minute. Didn't know if I was going to get it, but we got that all taken care of, and I like this. This is very few. You can get all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, the, some of the greater Futhark decks and stuff like that. And some of them are actually fairly expensive and fancy. I don't need fairly expensive and fancy. I need a deck that I can use. And I've started going through this and looking at the little booklet and, you know, just going over some things uh, pertaining to the rune. So this deck is going to get its own review video here pretty soon. So keep an eye out for that. And... Um, one of the things that I think is very cool is, uh, you know, through the last interview that I had with Alaric, there were people that had been messaging me and people that had been uh, leaving comments on some of the videos. And one of them was somebody from England who said that, you know, I have this book and the book that we're talking about tonight is Travels Through Middle Earth, The Path of a Saxon Pagan. And this person in England, actually, I've had about three different people. What do you think, before we get started, what do you think of the fact that you have, I've known people in Brazil that have talked about your books, people in England that have talked about your books. So basically, where there's any kind of a pagan pulse in the world, what do you think of your books being out there and, you know, being read by people? Well, it's actually kind of surprising. <laughs> um the revised version, the revised edition that's coming out addressed that to some extent, because when I wrote the original book, I mean, I'd been writing before, but I never had a book published. Uh, and of course, Llewellyn published the original one. So mm -hmm. it's you everywhere. And, you know, when I wrote it, I'm just kind of thinking a book for people who live near me. You know, it, it might it might be published, it might be read by people as far away as Oregon, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but and just, and you, all, actually, all of your books that you have written, uh, uh, other people have talked about. And, of course, um, I've checked out the reviews on uh, Saxon Sorcery on uh, Amazon. 
And there's, I mean, you know, you've got a few people that, you know, you can't ever really satisfy them for whatever reason, but it's like your books that are out there. People understand where you're coming from. They get it there. there you know, we have, because it's like, it used to be when it was the deluge of, of Llewellyn, where it's like truckloads and boatloads of books were coming out. So you didn't know which way to turn, who to listen to, where to go. Cause sometimes, you know, it's like, I always tell people, don't just, you know, don't read a book and expect to get everything you want out of it. You have to look at it and you have to see, you have to separate the bullshit for one thing, but you also have to say, does this speak to what I want? And there for the longest time, there was lots of gems in the Llewellyn lineup, but of course, you know, any publisher can put out crap sometimes. And so it's like, we went through that for years where you never knew except for the people that have really put it out there and said, you know, this is what I'm putting out to you. You can take it or leave it. But it's like, I try to say that in my books. I try, I mean, even the title of Travels to Middle Earth, uh, initially I was thinking, I mean, I, I thought about how I was going to word this. And the reason it's titled The Path of a Saxon Pagan. Mm -hmm. I, at first it was going to be the Saxon Pagan, but it's like, that sounds like I'm saying this is the path. Well, it's kind of like the, the, the controversy the that went on for bit. years about the witch's Bible by the yeah, cross and by the garage. It's like when you say it's the people kind of get, only. you know, but I yeah, think the thing is so cool. That, so I changed the title. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I made sure the title was very sp specific about it being this is where I'm coming from. And the you thing know, that I, do, I do mention other ways in fact that's one thing i another thing i tried to do two different things i tried to do in the revised mm -hmm. version uh but both of them involve inclusion one because i am aware that i have an international audience mm -hmm. um there are a lot of anglo-saxon pagan people in south america just ray buckland and i had a talk about that one time we discussed mm -hmm. it we were both really amazed how many people that's a south big america. surprise yes yeah and um and what I one thing I really like are my English fans when people, you know, because I am aware that even though I have a lot of English in my in my ancestry and, you know, it's still I'm I don't want people in the United Kingdom to think that I'm taking something of theirs and stealing it. Yeah, that, I've, cult, I've that a, almost cultural yeah, creation type thing. I've actually had a lot of support from people in England. I mean, I've, I've gotten emails from people saying, I'm so glad you wrote this book because you know it's like all I see is Celtic, 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 and my ancestors are Anglo-Saxon. Mm -hmm. So you know, that kind of support felt good. So I tried to make in, in the revised edition, one of the revisions was it's more worldly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not so aimed at Americans. If I, for example, I mention uh, in my chapter on ancestors, how as you know, a people, you can call upon people who are your ancestors who aren't necessarily your blood ancestors. And I listed, uh, thinking I'm talking to Americans because I wasn't expecting my book to go all over the planet. I listed, you know, some American heroes, like, like in American history, who mm -hmm. people might look to as, as spiritual ancestors. Well, in the revised version, thanks to different people who uh, have been very supportive of me across the globe, I I now have examples from different countries. You know and, what I'm saying? So it so, yeah. so someone who's living, say, in Argentina doesn't feel like they're being left out. Yeah. You know? I want them to feel included. And, and for people that are watching, that's the one thing, like Alaric saying, this is a revised version, this version is brought to you right now and it's going through special editions and things that are going to be coming out everything all the links and stuff to get some of these will be out uh once i get this the video version is going to uh, take the quick side to get uh edited and then the podcast actual audio most surprisingly takes a little bit more for me to edit but uh cross crow is the ones that are are you know putting this out there uh, in conjunction with alaric and so that's very good that there's, you know, that there's a publisher out there to do that. But the first question that I want to address with this, you know, whenever it says travels through Middle Earth, the path of a Saxon pagan, 
for you, as, as long as you've lived and been in, 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 in craft and pagan circles, and, and just the way that you've uh, expressed things in your life and looked through for those mysteries that kind of, you know, piece this all together, for you, what is Saxon? What does it mean? What is a Saxon pagan? Well, that's a pretty good question because it, there's a certain flexibility in there. Um, and it depends on who you're talking to. I'm using Saxon in a very generic sense, basically English. Um, if I were to write another book on this topic, I was, I've toyed with the idea of actually doing it and, and referring to it as Old English, mm -hmm. because that's really where I'm coming from. I, I know there are some people out there, I mean, they are such reenactors, they are so specific. I, they will write me a letter and say, well, I practice and they, what people did in this one little tiny area, you know, you know, all of England, the entirety. That of, entire Ireland, Ireland, everybody was different. It's the size of Missouri. Yeah, you know, really, I mean, yeah, you're not putting it down. That's just the fact, though. It's it like is, yeah. There. It's like you can day trip pretty much anywhere. You know, it's, <laughs> it's not that big. So it's. You know, as far as I'm concerned, I, I mean, I'm not going to like worrying about whether it's West Saxon or South Saxon or whatever. And I'm using Saxon in the sense of the English people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there there never were any people who were actually called Anglo-Saxons. This was a much later, I mean, as far as calling themselves that, this is a much later term that was, in, you know, coined to describe the Germanic English culture. Um, the people who showed up as, you know, who on those shores, they wound up calling themselves the English, which is why it's England. Um, but uh, other people very often call them Saxons. And so, you know, these terms get kind of loose. Uh, I'll just admit I'm a, when, when I'm in my eight-year-old boy phase, I'm a total Robin Hood geek, yes. you know? and so that's kind of where I lean with it. It's like the Saxons versus the Normans. Yeah, because the, it's like with what people don't realize is like you have the Angles and you have the Normans, and especially in the 11th century onward, you know, the time of of uh, Richard and all that stuff, you know, the, the the wars between France and the Saracen invasions and things like that. The English were the ones that were repressed by the Normans. Yes, and so it was just like there was there was so much that was put down onto the English people. And just as an example, we just recently, and for everybody that's had their llama celebrations and stuff, for us we did a a, a thing where we had Frey Faxi, and for our uh, benefactor of the evening, it was Ingve Freer, and Ingve is Ing, which gives you England, English. And stuff like that. And so it's like, there are these things that, you know, I consider the English, the old English, the people that came there in the beginning, you know, as, as e e before Stonehenge was even a, a thing, is like, I consider they were the underdogs for a lot of things. And that's how they developed. They had to be tough. They had to be innovative with the way that they were. And part of the way that they they just did things as pagans was very, I think was very, very innovative for back in that time. And that's why I think, you know, outside of the heathen thing with the Vikings and all this other stuff, I think it's cool that we're starting to get a lot more people that are reading your books and are wanting to find out what is this all about? Because, you know, they can be as specific for all these little parts and places as they want to. But when you look at it the way you've done it in this revision, which I have it up on the computer and I've got some notes here, but it's just like you're giving it to people in a way that is very accessible and you're not painting it tight. You're painting it with a broad brush and the way that you can, that you can give it clarity and, and, to people. What is your definition going to be? The definition varies from one person to another. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, when What's the cutoff on Anglo-Saxon? There are some people who would cut off, would make the cut off 
like in the seventh century with the death of King Pinda, who was the last of the pagan Saxon kings. Um, they'd say, oh, well, that's the end of the old, I mean, Saxon ways. Mm -hmm. Other people would take it further on to 1066 when the Normans came in, because, you know, as well as I do, just because somebody says, hey, we'll start worshiping Jesus doesn't mean they gave up everything else mm -hmm. necessarily. Yes, um, that's very true. Yeah, so even when the cutoff is going to be, and then there's something, another feature in there that I think is important. Uh, sometimes I get criticized by eclectic people because I have actually picked a path. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. and I, I don't really understand the eclectic thing. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's like, I want to at least have something to focus on. Yeah, uh, what just people don't understand is that because I'm Anglo-Saxon, this is not a prison. You know, it's like, it's, it's a focus. It doesn't limit me. It focuses me. But mm -hmm. just like my English ancestors, it's like, if there's something out there I want to use, I'm going to pull it out and use it. And so, you know, is, is, uh, I mean, there are all sorts of things I make use of that are not necessarily Anglo-Saxon, especially like in the realm of, of say, like magic. But, mm -hmm. you know, in the same way, the ancient Anglo-Saxons didn't have, you know, automatic dishwashers either, but I'm not giving mine up. And, and, and that's another thing, like, I've, I've always had this because of the fact, you know, as far as, as far as you go back in the craft and pagan tradition, and I'm coming up on 32 years or however long it's been now, but like, I'm one of those people, eclectics have their place, I, I let them be, but for me, I'm one of those because I... I'm a druid. I'm a witch. I'm a ceremonialist. I'm one of those people that everybody says, well, you're spreading yourself too thin. No, I'm not. I'm doing what's right for my spirit and my body and the things that I want to do. But it's like out of order, out of, out of chaos comes order. That's the way it is. I can't be so eclectic. Like, let's say you're doing an Egyptian ritual with a Native American pipe smoking uh, yeah, ceremony really and tied to it <laughs> that just goes a little bit too far but with the way you know with the way you write and the way that you are putting out your path as far as being you know with saxon it's everybody thinks it is a focus but it's it, it is a, it is a focus but it's not limiting the bubble's not mm -hmm. small the bubble is as big as the universe because there's places that you can explore magically historically spiritually yeah, even, everything even spiritually, it's not it's, it's like not, i'll i'll freely admit i totally groove on apollo if i go to something like some kind of pagan festival or something and someone's holding a ritual to apollo i'll be there <laughs> you know because uh -huh. you know there to my knowledge there's only one god that's jealous of all the other gods yeah you know, yeah. and it isn't one of mine. You, you know, I just do not believe that Woden gets his panties in a bunch because I went to an Apollo ritual. <laughs> you know, now I, I wouldn't try to do some weird mashup where I've got Woden and Apollo and Huan Yin and, you know, like yeah, all yeah. together. But it's like, but again, it's like, I'm not confined. I can do what I want. I can do mm -hmm. <laughs> And, you know, it's like, I, I, I've looked over and the one thing is like, I want to, I want to focus in on things that are about the book, but I'm not going to give anything away. But uh, having well, said that, the original was published, you know, in 2009. Well, I mean, you not know, a lot of like, secrets to give away there. Well, yeah, <laughs> but it's like also, so we we we're looking at this idea of what is Saxon, Saxon, how how it is that you came across, you know, for your life, and you've worked for so many years as a Saxon pagan, you know, having that pagan aspect into things. My next question, and, you know, looking at the way that you put everything together in the book, the question is, how important are the gods in all of this? I don't know. Can you, like, rephrase that somehow? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. In, in, in the idea of, of, you know, as far as a Saxon tradition, you have Woden and mm -hmm. Thunor and all these different, you know, uh, you know, ideas and beings to you know, attach this to, it's like, what are, because a lot of people, they ask, well, what God do I have to do this with, and, and all that stuff, you oh, know, and, okay. is it really, you know, what are the importance of the gods within Saxon tradition? 
in your idea? Well, your... I mean, again, this is going to vary from one person to another. I, I've known people who are definitely Anglo-Saxon pagans who put most of their own reverence into like ancestors rather than deity. Deity is very important to me. Um, however, I think we misunderstand pagan deities a lot because we're influenced by a couple of factors. One, it was Roman state religion, which is different from individual personal religion. And also the fact that most of what we know about deities, regardless of what culture we're talking about, most of the original scholarship that comes down to us, it's like it has been filtered so heavily mm -hmm. through Christian scholarship. And, you know, I, and I'm not dogging on Christians, but this is just how it is. It's, everybody yes, brings their own baggage in. Everyone yeah. has their baggage. And they've influenced this. So you have things like, you'll have someone say a, a deity is, well, let's take Thunor, who's basically the Anglo-Saxon version of Thor. You, you hear someone talk about Thor and the first thing people say, oh, he's the God of thunder. Well, yeah, because we got all this through Christians who didn't really believe in the gods. Mm -hmm. You know, they had their God who was all powerful, all knowing, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So when they're writing about these other gods, they have a tendency, whether intentional or not, to present them as static, one dimensional archetypes that can't do anything other than this. So, yeah, so Thunor is a thunder god, but what a lot of people don't know is Thunor or Thor is also a fertility god. Mm -hmm. You know, he. He was a, a friend to the farmer. Yeah, and most of the deities are that way. If we were to go, I'm going to step out of Saxon for a minute, because I think this is something that most people would be familiar with. Mm -hmm. If you were to go to ancient Athens, everyone knows that you know the official party line is Athena is the goddess of wisdom. But if you lived in ancient Ad in Athens, Athena was your goddess. She was your goddess of pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. She wasn't limited to one function. Yeah, none she wasn't stuck in a box were, with just one, one label yes, on it. Yeah, and None of our gods are limited to a function. Now, granted, I do think that they have, you know, their interests, the things that they are partial to, mm -hmm. and through personal experiences uh, with deity, I... You know, that has always supported that. Uh, when I, just before I started writing as a published author, just before this started, I had never had really much of a thing with Woden. It just hadn't. You know, I knew who he was. I think there was not really a connection there. And uh, on the other, Ng, our, our boy Ng, he was my homeboy. He was the one who I went to for everything. And it was Ng who was, was telling me, you need to develop a relationship with Woden. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't tell me why, but I just need to do this. So, okay. So I started working on developing a relationship with Woden. And then I got the message from Woden that he had something for me to do. And not long after that, circumstances uh, worked out where Christopher Penzak was telling me, you really need to write a book. And then it was on a long drive home after that conversation with Christopher when I realized this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's that was the birth of Travels Through Middle Earth. So here you have an example of, okay, why Woden? Because Woden is the God in Anglo-Saxon culture. He's the God of inspiration. He's, he brings us mead. He you know, inspires the poet as well as the warrior. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see Ing was passing the ball to him. But I do believe while that happens that at the same time, any of our gods can do pretty much anything better than we can because they are gods. That's right. Yes. So that was my, oh, I'll get off my soapbox now. That's my thing. About <laughs> and, and because that's, that's uh, you know, a lot of things because 
back in the day, whenever I was learning, you know, even before my first initiation and things, it was like, there was so much about any path, not just this or, or whatever, that was so confusing because of the fact that, you know, there was, there was two sides, there, there is two sides to every coin. And then, you know, you have the idea of the gods of whatever pantheon, whatever culture, whatever tradition, there are those that will uh, give them the uh, status of abstraction, archetypes, Jungian things, uh, yin yang, the whole, that whole situation. And then you have on the other side of it, that coin is you have the pagan literalist. And I'm kind of one of those that believe the minute I step out of this apartment and I'm outside in this world, I'm with the gods as a literal situation, something that's going on. So you have, you know, the, the people that wrestle with the idea of, you know, uh, the gods as, as, as therapy. And then you have the people that are doing the, you know, the pagans that are getting out there in the woods and going to all these places and doing these different things because we feel that the gods have an actual influence, not on just what we think in our mind, but things that go on on the planet, like the harvest, like people, the fertility of everything. Those aren't abstractions, animals having babies, all this different things. That's not an abstract idea. That's reality. So that's the reason well, why it's not talking about aspects. You're talking about something totally different than what you or I would be talking about when we're talking about the gods. Um, John Michael Greer, who is a brilliant man, if you can ever get him on your show, um, he's the author of A World Full of Gods. And I was at a discussion some kind of panel discussion that he was involved in. And I remember him saying something and it just really hit me. He said that, that archetypes are not the gods. Mm -hmm. Archetypes are how we relate to the gods. Mm -hmm. In other words, I, you have a mother, I assume, you know, I have a mother. Right? Mm -hmm. They aren't the same mother. No, nope. you know, there's the individuals, but they but they fulfill that mother archetype for mm -hmm. us. You know, so likewise, you can have a a god. Okay, again, let's take take Woden as a god of inspiration. Of inspiration, mm -hmm. there's part of his archetype, but that doesn't mean he's the same as. A deity from another culture that fulfills that same archetype. The archetype is not the god. The archetype is how we relate to a god. And 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 that's the thing is like you know it's it's good that you and others are writing books that kind of give a broader uh, you know aspect of what things are. Um, you know because of the fact that. As far as like, if you really look at the totality of what we see through, you know, as many different publishers that, that are out there, people that me and you personally know and have, have met and talked to in the greater actual paid community that we know, and then just seeing, you know, the way things have developed over the years. One thing that I have noticed as far as, you know, what we have out there, other than the historical stuff that we have to look back at, you know, the way that things came into England and that whole realm is, you know, however many years ago it was. When you look at it, there's a lot more, it's either two things, either there's a lot more Wicca 101, or there's a lot more uh, as a true Viking, all that stuff. And this wee little smidge of, you know, what could be considered anything tied to, to you know, the Saxon path, uh, anything very there's a lot of stuff that deals with various types of uh, viking and, and as a true magical practices there's not a lot of uh, magical work outside of you know rune galder and things like that that they really focus in on but whenever you look at the little bits and pieces that are uh you know for for where we're at you know with our uh saxon work and stuff Along with your book and, and along with all of your books, just for somebody that's listening to this and seeing this on YouTube, 
as a place to start, let's say they, they've gone out and got them all. They have all of your books, um, other than might what be in the, in the bibliographies and stuff like that. As far as places and things for people to check out, as far as learning a little bit more and seeing what ties into some of the things you're talking about, who are some of the people, authors, and books and things that you would, one or two that you would just like say, Okay, you're reading mine, but here's a couple things here that might really tie it in here. Check these out. What are the stuff for you that you would think that would be? Specifically for Anglo-Saxon? Or in, 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 yeah, anything that's tied to it, yeah. Okay, specifically for Anglo-Saxon, most of it's going to be in bibliographies because I try to direct people in the bibliography to things. Um, I think Lost Gods of England is critical. It's something everyone who follows the Saxon path should read. Uh, um, one problem with a lot of the Anglo-Saxon stuff is it tends to be really boring. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. That was one reason why I wrote the book that I wrote. Uh, yeah, I wanted something that people could read and would, it was easy to read and comfortable to read. So if someone's looking for something that's really scholarly and you know, and dry and dull, that's not it. I you have a really good, uh, you know, because I've read I haven't I haven't read every single word of it, but I've read like three quarters of the copy of the the, uh, the approval revised. document that that she sent me. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I like is like with you and Dr. Buckland and Scott Cunningham and a couple other people, your writing style is a not dry. B, it's not condescending because so many people put themselves up there, you know, and you can tell their tone in the way that they write, that it kind of, it kind of puts people at, at, at dis-ease because they're like, what is this guy talking about? They seem like they're so far up here, but I'm, you know, I'm down here on earth level. So, you know, certain writers can go a little bit beyond what their readers, you know, can, can take thing. in. You know, you can, I mean, it's fine to write a scholarly work, but only you know, and I know people who write scholarly works and, you know, they will all back me up on this. You're not going to get a wide circulation with that. Yeah, because scholars read scholarly works. Yeah, you know, but the average person doesn't. The average person get, gets confused very quickly or bored very quickly. And that wasn't my intention for any of my books. They are, you know, I mean, I, I have my own goals and stuff. Whenever I write a book, uh, an Anglo-Saxon book like this or a handbook of Saxon sorcery and magic, both of those were written with the intention of bringing people to the old gods of England. That was what I wanted to do, you know, and and you have done that. I mean, it's like we were saying earlier, these people that are I mean, I've been getting messages on on videos and things and, you know, you'll see stuff in various things that people will just say this book by Lyric Albertson check it out. And it's like, I might not even be looking for that, but the minute it, cause I know you, but it's like the minute I see that I go, Oh, okay. And that's cool because that means people out there are getting it. But here's another little thing, a little side note. One thing that I really thought was cool. And in some of the portions of your book was the, the, you know, tying in, you know, talking about uh, the, the, the knowing of Dr. Buckland and, and the, CX Wicca and things like that. As far as before his passing, had Dr. Buckland known anything of your writings and what did he, did he give you any advice? Did he say anything about your books? I'm just curious if you had any conversations. We had conversations for sure. We had a lot of behind the scenes conversations. I mean, I'm laughing, but it's in a good way. It's like, yeah, it really come out. And um, like a, there is a book that was published by who published it? A company in England. I should know this. Moon Books published a, a book that was called Witchcraft Today, sixty years later, and the title was based on Gardner's book Witchcraft Today, mm -hmm. and uh, it was published sixty years after the publication of that. And the idea was to showcase all the different Wiccan traditions that have come up as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the editor had contacted me, Trevor Greenfield uh, in England had contacted me and asked me to write the chapter. They wanted to have one chapter about CX Wicca. Okay. And 
I said, I don't really feel comfortable doing this. It's like, yes, I have practiced Sax Wicca in the past, but it's not really what I do for the most part now. And you know, I don't feel comfortable with it. So I refused or, or declined, really. And then several months later, he gets in contact with me again. And I declined a second time. And this almost sounds like drama because the third time I accepted, but the reason I accepted the third time is because the third time he asked me to do this, a kind of coalition of SAX Wicca practitioners in Peru had done this like survey on who they felt were the most important influential people in the SAX Wiccan tradition today. Mm -hmm. Now this of course was back when Ray was alive. And and, uh, and, you know, Ray Buckland got to be number one, which, mm -hmm. duh, you know. Yeah. But the thing that astounded me was I was number two. <laughs> and it's like, okay, fine, I'll write this thing. Apparently, there are people out there who think that I am qualified to write something like this. But I still didn't feel entirely comfortable doing that. I don't know mm -hmm. why they just didn't go to Ray, or maybe they had and he refused but he didn't refuse me. And we had a lot of conversations about Sayak Wicca and what his intentions had been and how it evolved and everything mm -hmm. when I wrote this chapter for the book. You know, um, that was probably the most extensive interaction I had with him. But, you know, I, I met him in 1980 at uh, Pan Pagan, at a Pan Pagan festival. And, you know, then after I became a published author, because I'm a published author, we wound up connecting. Mm -hmm. We were both speakers at the Earth Warriors Festival one year. And we wound up just kind of like hanging out in the corner together talking. It was pretty cool. Uh, you know, so yes, we had a lot of interactions and Ray actually had one of my books. I signed a copy of Travis Middle Earth for him and uh, he signed my copy of what used to be the tree, but the revised one that came The out. revised version. Yeah, I have the original, yeah. but yeah. yeah. I have the original too, but I didn't have that with me I when know. he was there to sign it. So I have a, I have a signed copy of, oh, Buckland's Book of Saxon Witchcraft. Yeah. Yes. The new one, yeah, yeah, and so uh, that's very cool. interactions. I think the th thing that's very cool is like you you can look at the way that you wrote Travels through Middle through Middle Earth, and then you can look at the tree and the two things that like when I interviewed Dr. Buckland on my show years ago, the main thing, the reason why is because you know he'd written so much, he was a prolific writer just from mm -hmm. front to back. But the thing that, you know, the reason why I focused on the tree is because at that time, you know, and, uh, you know, it's like I'm one of those people that I'm not uh, uh, against trying new things, looking into new situations that might even remotely, you know, have some connection to me because I do have English ancestry. I have German ancestry. I have Irish ancestry mm -hmm. and Scottish. So it's like if I have those things tied, why can't I go ahead and look into that stuff? And when I was talking to Dr. Buckman, I think the thing that was most important to me was the fact that whenever he wrote the tree, he basically said, you know, he'd done the Gardnerian thing. And there, as he was going on, there were things that he said that were, you know, not up to his snuff either there for the longest time. And he goes, well, you know, because I had getting ready to do Big Blue and stuff, because basically I believe that Big Blue is the tree in extension in a, a much larger format you know it's just the thing that he was able to put out there to the public matter of fact he says it in big blue that there are parts of the tree that are kind of ext extantly in there so the thing that i thought was so cool about it was the fact that you know it used to be that the only way that you could ever be considered a witch or whatever is if you did hook up with a gardenerian coven or some other traditional witchcraft group that could initiate you and all these things. And Ray said, with, you know, CX Wicca, we're going to do it this way because, you know, making it a little bit more accessible, like the idea of self-initiation. There were high priestesses back in the 70s losing their shit because they thought, oh, it's a travesty. 
you know, that's taking away our power. No, it's not. There are people well, it was, over- No, it was. It was taking away their power because things were, I mean, we, we talked a lot. Like I said, we talked a lot about why he put together SAX Wicca. And that was one of the problems. And it, you can see it if you want to see some documentation on it. Uh, Michael Lloyd wrote a book called Bull of Heaven. And it's really, it's supposed to be a biography of Ed Budzinski. Uh, but it also it really covers the entire East Coast uh, witchcraft scene mm -hmm. in the 1970s. And it's just appalling when you look at it now. Not only did you have to be initiated, you know, to be recognized, but they even had this thing. I can't remember the word that they used, but if you're high priestess, you know, even after you were third degree, if you did something that annoyed this person years down the road, you could have your initiation revoked. Oh, no. which not only revokes yours, but everybody who you initiated. Yeah, because of just, lineage and things like that. Yeah, yeah, it was just insane stuff that was going on. And these people, these very power hungry people. I mean, Ray had several different goals in mind when he set up Sax Wicca. And you know, I re I remember when it came out. I'm one of the, I may I may be the oldest practicing Sax Wiccan out there for all I know because I've been Sax Wicca. I've been a yes it since uh, 1975, and I think the tree was published in 1974. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, you know, but we talked about it extensively what he was trying to do, and one thing he was trying to do is to get away from this power struggle. Yeah. One thing I do love about it, if you're going to practice Wicca, one thing I love about this is it does not allow for a power struggle. In the Sax tradition, you, you become a yeset. There's yeses. It's an old English word that means a companion. We're all companions. Mm -hmm. Nobody's over anybody. There's no elders. There's no witch kings. There's no leaders you know there's nobody, no degrees there's no yeah there's not even any degrees there's like you know you either are or you aren't and even at that you you may join a coven and be initiated and i have initiated people into the sax mm -hmm. we're getting ready to do some initiations this sound sound in as well but if someone doesn't have access to that they can just go before an altar, give themselves to the gods, and then do it you themselves. Say, you don't get to say, well, you're not really initiated because nobody cares. And you know, that's one no of the hierarchy. things. That's one of the things that we talked about in our last uh, interview was the fact that I'm one of those people, like, you know, because of the, the priestesses with the ego and the power tripping and these priests that go through all this crap. Initiation is from the gods, it's not from Joe. Mm -hmm. or bob or suzanne or whatever yeah, to me initiation is like marriage you know the wedding is not the marriage you know the wedding is a celebration acknowledging something that happened mm -hmm. likewise the initiation ritual is not what's happened the initiation ritual is a celebration acknowledging something that has happened within that person mm -hmm. um oh, i want to say this also another thing this but, you know, because I was saying a big thing to me was to bring people to Woden. And very few people know this, but that was one of Ray's goals with Sax Wicca. Because again, everything's Celtic, Celtic, Celtic. And mm -hmm. he's from over there. Woden is one of his ancestral deities. And he wanted to bring back the worship of Woden. He's been so highly criticized by some people in the community because he did this within the framework of Wicca. But at no time did he ever pretend that Sayax Wicca was like some kind of a recreation of ancient Saxon religion. He's very mm -hmm. upfront about using Saxon trappings and imagery and all on a skeleton of Wicca. Uh, but part of his reasons was because if people are going to do Wicca, he did want to bring them back to the old gods. And it's it's something okay. that is a, a starting point in association. Here's a here's an example of that. Okay, in your book, there's a there's a word that people that you have used there, and certain people and there's uh, groups on Facebook that have it. Fernsidu. Okay, mm -hmm. there is another abstraction of that. There's a guy that's on uh, YouTube that 
he's got a fairly good size thing going on with his situation. And the, their thing is called al Sadu, which is basically the same thing, old ways, just mm-hmm. saying it different. But this guy's deal is he's one of those that like brings it down to a, like a pinpoint. And his thing is like, you, he says, you can't do this as wicked. You can't do this as witchcraft. And then you get the as a true people that say, you know, they call it wicked true, you know, for those that are trying to bring that, you know, in there, you know, whatever the witchcraft into things and stuff. But the only thing is like, okay, there are a lot of self-professed heathens. There are a lot of self-professed Vikings and stuff that all they do is hold moots, do bloat and stumble and a couple other little things. So they don't have any real focuses for magic. So you look at the association that Ray put together for CX Wicca as the idea of Woden and Freya. Okay, so you've got that. Freya is a goddess of witchcraft. She's not the goddess of Azatru or any of these, because uh, all Azatru is, is just true to gods or whatever the basic uh, you know, naming of it. So it's like, if we are doing these rituals that are more magical and not, you know, drinking the beer and, you know, being the warriors and all this stuff, that they, they consider that beneath them. Mm-hmm. I don't, I mean, let, they can do what they want to do, you know, but for us, it's like this, you know, even CX Wicca, as far as, you know, it, Saxon pagans that might not have the name Wicca thrown on anything that they do, but they might have practices that evolve from that. It's like the thing is we can do that because we are, we're, we're working with it. We're doing the magic with it. We're doing all this other stuff. So we're just going to keep rolling with it. We're going to let them go. But this guy, just this old Sadu guy, he was just so very persnickety about this stuff. And he everything else, he ties into a lot of the stuff that you've talked about in your book and, you know, things that we've talked about in the last interview and stuff like that. And it's just like, you know, it's to me, it's kind of sad that you well, have to have that kind of a thing going on because, you know, it's by that guy being that way, you know, having that demeanor about stuff he is kind of, you know, limiting what other people could do. And I just well, don't doesn't. get that really. He, doesn't. he just, you know, he, he will have a certain cult following, but that sort of thing, mostly he's turning people away from the gods. He's not attra- drawing them to them. Um, and, and it's not something that's just, you know, limited to Northern European culture. You'll see that everywhere. Mm-hmm the Hellenics who get you know their panties in a bunch everything has to be just this way or it's just not done right uh, I don't care what group it is there's you'll find ceremonial magicians who do it there's always yeah, somebody yeah. out there who I've got again okay th- this is where again I say people don't leave their baggage at the door I mean it's kind of impossible it's it's a lifelong journey I will always be a little bit of a Presbyterian <laughs> you know, I have to watch myself on that, you know, like, yeah. am I really doing this, you know, or am I falling back on a pattern that I learned when I was very, very young? Uh-huh. And the pattern is, the pattern that we come in with is my way, the one way is the right way. Mm-hmm. Everything else is not as good. You know, it can be very difficult to really live pagan. And by pagan, I mean to come in and realize I've got this path that means so much to me. It means everything to me. Mm-hmm. But this other person is doing something different and it's just as good. Yeah. You know, and it's just as good for this person. You know, that's the most difficult thing to do because we were not brought into the world that way. Yeah. Yeah. Know? All of us who are first generation, at least, were brought in with the idea that there is one path that is good and everything else is inferior. Yeah. And it's like, that's the one thing I, you know, I, there's always this one part of me because I'm a little bit of a fierce guy. I never, sometimes I let my mouth overload my ass, but like, I have to not, sometimes I have to rein myself in and not say anything because some certain little things kind of needle in the back of the neck, but I go, that's their, that's their gig Mm -hmm. they're gonna do that there's nothing i can do to stop it change it alter it or do anything but as far as like i actually have certain things that i've taught myself to say 
especially after becoming, you know, because you can hold yourself up for a while, but if you become a published author, you have to get out there and talk to all sorts of people who have ideas that you think are just dumb as hell, you know, to me. But mm -hmm. I realized that it may be very important to them. So I have, I actually learned a lot of things to say to people when internally I'm thinking, well, yeah, because these, these interactions are happening <laughs> and you're learning, you know, because there's going to be people that you go, you know, you'll give them the thumbs up and there'll be times when you'll be smiling and you'll be talking and you'll be saying, yeah. but in your head, there'll be the alter alert going. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, but that's not my place to let that out. Yeah, because, that's that's true. It's like, well, we got to know. Yeah, we got to know when to, you know, kind of keep those things to ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, next thing I want to talk about is like I've looked over a, 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 the one thing that I like is uh, overall this book to me it's not just a how to it's like you know because there's so many like I say Wicca 101 and all this stuff where it's just recipes and rituals for 360 pages and you never really get to understand where the person's coming from and a lot of the magical things um, uh, that you put in there, you know, about the holy, holy tides and some of this other stuff. One of the things that I kind of want to talk about now is how did you, you know, so people can know, how did you come about, about you know, some of the things that you did as far as your practices of, mass, of, of magic, you know, even whenever you were first starting out before you wrote these books and you know, how do you think that as over time, and even since you wrote this revision and stuff like that, what are some of the aspects of Saxon magic that you think are, you know, the most important or good places for people to start, you know, right away, something that people can grasp, like the minute that they get done reading your book, where do you think people should start with this? For magic? Yes, Okay, because honestly, you know, Travis and Middle Earth really isn't about magic so much. There's you know? a little bit, but I, but just the way it like, kind of and it was intentionally like that. I mean, intentionally because, like you said, every book that comes out is how can I cast a spell on my boyfriend? So and that's the reason why I like this book is because even though it's not packed with all of these things that are like that, just the way that you explain, you know, the, all of that stuff and yeah, kind and of I'm tied okay it with, together, like, I'm you okay know, with people who don't do magic. I mean, not everybody. Magic to me is a skill, you know, I'm mm -hmm. fairly good at it, but, you know, carpentry, I'm terrible at, you know, <laughs> not everybody's going to be great at magic. And if you're not, there's no shame in it. Yeah, that's, that's true. The that's why everybody true. who becomes pagan has to be expected to get involved with magic. For some people, it's just not their thing. Yeah, that's um, true. You know, so because of what was out there. I wanted a book out there that specifically focused on spirituality and not magic. I felt like I had to at least include one little chapter on it, but my chapter- And that is chapter is pretty good. Review. That's it's why not I... really, It's not really a how to do it. It's just like, no, this yeah. is what Anglo-Saxon magic is like. And then after I wrote all that, because I do absolutely love magic, it's uh, then I was able to write uh, a handbook of sex and sorcery and magic, which that's there. If you want a book on how to do magic, that's and, what I would send you and, to. And, and that's, that's the thing. It's like people, if you can get like, you know, because we're going to talk some more about, you know, the publishing of this, this book, because it's getting ready to come out here pretty soon. Mm -hmm. But as far as the, the duo for this is this and the, the sex and sorcery, because, you know, the way that that you framed it in that little chapter, chapter and a half, whatever. It's like you're letting it be known that, it, especially in this book, you're not making that focus, but you're showing people in the, those chapters that, you know, that there is something there to lead you, that the Saxon path overall as a pagan can lead you in that direction. You know, like I say, not everybody has to do magic, but, you know, for me, it's not, Everybody thinks magic is like you're trying to win the lottery or get new tires for your car. But it's like, for me, magic is spiritual. It, mm -hmm. It's something that adds to our spirit before we die and go on to our next existence. Every little magical action that we do increases, our, increases who we are. It gives us a little bit more of something. Some people don't want that. Some people just want to be 
at the ritual and, and hang out afterwards and stuff. And that's in other, okay. that's other words, mm-hmm. others want to be in the middle of it and really experience it. And that's the reason why I've you know done the way I've done for years as far as like interviewing people and going to ritual and stuff. I'm one of those particip- participatory, I can't say, people because I'm learning every day. It's like, you know, that's another thing. Whenever people are, are you know, getting a book, they should have the idea that I'm a believer that if an author is a good author, they're going to write as if they're always going to be a student. They're, they're not an authority. They're somebody that's still learning, still having things come up in their life that they're going, oh, wow, I didn't know this, this, and this. It's always a learning situation. And I think the way you put that chapter and those little bits of things, it's like something that is going to set off the light bulbs in people's head want them they are going to want to get your other book and kind of do it and i think that's another thing because you said you know about the idea of ink telling you to get with Woden and get this thing going i think every little thing you know whether it's people that are just wanting to do the spiritual side of things or to do the whole package it's like you're fulfilling that you're 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 doing you're doing it and no, i was just thinking <laughs> yeah and you know so it's like some people are going to want to know, well, it's like, you know, how, how to, just like as an example, how do I say this? Like magic is experiential. Okay. It's just, there's no way that you can get around it. But I think this, I think writing of this book was an act of magic, whether people know it or not. I think anytime you put yourself out there, especially as people like we are that are involved in occult situations and things, Every little bit that you do, all of your books were works of magic, whether people know it or not. But it's just like, I think to answer their question, they're just going to have to read this book because from the beginning to getting getting closer and closer to the end and stuff with it and things. And I've jumped around to see what some of your real bullet points were with it. And it's like, I don't know. There's, there, there is a place to start. And like you said, You know, you guys are going to have to look through the bibliographies for a lot more stuff. And then, you know, I've had these people that are, you know, they want to know about magic, but they're afraid. It's like, I'll tell you this. I say, people, look, if you are afraid to do magic, do it anyway, because the gods aren't going to bop you in the head if you drop a candle or if your chalice falls over. We all learn by, you know, doing. And if we make a mistake, we fix it and go on and make things better. And that's the way pagans do. It's like, you know, whenever we go out there and we have our rituals in the woods and things like that, you know, sometimes they go off without a hitch. And other times we leave the ritual and later on something comes up and we kind of go, things weren't the way they could have been, the way they should have been. And so people that are analytical and can think in that realm are going to go, okay, Well, how can I do it better next time? That's why I think the Saxon Sorcery book is going to be the one that people are going to want to get because that's going to give them the ideas of how to focus in and kind of, you know, meld what you're saying in this. And it's like, it's a reflection of you too. It's just showing this, you know, Alaric's putting his path out there. And this is something that you don't have to be afraid of. You know, even just the spiritual side, you don't have to be afraid of it because I've had also, I've had people that, you know, even, you know, since I've known about your writings and stuff is people have asked me, well, I'm afraid to read some of these pagan books and stuff. And I'm going, okay, why? Because, well, I don't know if they're afraid of just learning something, but they think that, you know, with, especially with the climate that we're living in today, that, you know, by reading these things, either you know, they, they could have somebody, they could have family members that they could get in trouble with and all this other stuff. And I'm one of those people, family be damned. If you're free white and over 21, you know, do you now don't, you know, if your family is really wacko, kind of keep it on the down low and just don't be, you know, openly loud about what you're doing and stuff, because you have that right to do that. Everybody has a right to do that. And it's like, I don't know. It's just the, the, the magic is something that you are putting, you're putting out there. And I think people are getting it because even in some magical Viking Norse groups and stuff, 
as far as you know, people have been talking about certain rituals and certain practices. Saxons and sorcery and, and work cutting, your book has been brought up several times. So there are people that are really taking that into account too. So you are giving them a whole realm of things to look into for real. Well, and you know, you do have to, it's a, it's a shame if people are afraid because of their families or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you know, people of any color, if you want to live safely, you have to come out of that closet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was, I was told this a long time ago, and I really believe it. You need to keep the closet door completely shut or open it up. You know, don't. It's one way or the measure. other to be yeah, real to yourself. Yeah. The halfway measure is where you're, you are in danger. Um, but coming out is really important on a lot of different levels. It's like the more people, I mean, uh, and I mean, be reasonable about it. When I go to the grocery store, I do kind of look at what I have on and try not to have anything that's too in your face because yeah. I'm not going to the grocery store to prove a point. I'm kind of going to the grocery store as a neighbor. Yeah. I kind of think of like, well, what if the situation would be reversed? You know, so I might wear a small pendant or something like that. You know, I might wear my hammer. Uh, because if I'm in the grocery store and I see somebody with a crucifix on, you know, a cross thing on, I don't faint or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, I don't want to be standing next to somebody who has, you know, a God hates bags t-shirt, you know? So, <laughs> I don't, you know, I try not to have, I mean, I have this wonderful sweatshirt that I got from uh, Hartman Pagan Festival when I was uh, vice president. It, it came out in at the Hartman Pagan Festival, 1991, I believe. Yes, 1991. And it's a beautiful sweatshirt that has, has a kind of God figure and a goddess figure and they're wonderful. But the goddess figure is so bosomy and out there with <laughs> covering her up. And I've got to remember, I have to keep my, you know, it's like, you don't wear this to the grocery store. Because people are going to be a little bit, whoa. Well, and not that there's anything wrong with it, but because this lady here is going to be very uncomfortable if I'm standing next to her. Yeah. That shirt. And that's not my point. I'm not there to make people uncomfortable, you know? So, you know, you have to use some reason. You want to be a good neighbor. You want, you, you don't want to intentionally cause chaos and discord, but at the same yeah. time, it's important to be true to yourself and be honest with yourself. And frankly, in my life, I've had very few problems because of it. Once in a while, you run into that total asshole, you know, but most yeah. people, if you act and decent, you just deal with it, if, if you come into that on, on occasion, you just deal with it and move on because mm -hmm. yeah. dwelling on it doesn't really do anything. It doesn't help, mm -hmm. you know. Um, also, speaking of your publisher, Crossed crow how did it come about that you guys teamed up to do this oh it was they approached me about it oh wow yeah. very cool i even because i was looking for something else i found it just like yesterday the message from cross cut pro where they contacted me i can't remember when it was i think it was like last maybe last December or something like that. But anyway, they contacted me and said, hey, we're interested in publishing this, which was a thrill for me because I knew that Llewellyn had taken it out of publication. And I mm -hmm. understood why. Well, that's, that's the downside of dealing with a company the size of Llewellyn. The good side is your book gets everywhere. The downside is it has to keep selling at a certain level. Or, or they they'll drop it, it. yeah. Yeah, they have too much. They've got so much coming through. They cannot, you know, afford to have, you know, carry books that don't sell so many a year. Yeah. My head dropped below that. So they weren't, they weren't mean about it at all, but they were taking it off. Mm -hmm. And I knew that had happened. Um, I knew that there were people who felt like it was an important work and wanted it to uh, be you know, come back into publication. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a suggested reading list book. It was a suggested reading in the uh, uh, ADF organization for Anglo-Saxon 
pagans who mm -hmm. belong to their group. And uh, in fact, a, a past archdruid of ADF contacted me and su suggested that ADF itself might publish it. So I contacted ADF, but the person who handled their books was, it was really, it was just a weird exchange. I, I said, hey, I've got this book, if you're interested in it, I, because I had contacted Llewellyn and they very kindly gave me all the rights, I let all the rights revert to me. Mm -hmm. So now I have all the rights again. So I tell this person, I've got the book, I've got all the rights, would you be interested in publishing it? And instead I get this lecture on what different kind of rights there are and things. And it's like, okay, I don't know if you don't understand the concept of all- Publishing rights. You know, yeah. All pretty much is a simple word, you know? <laughs> so I, I didn't really pursue it. And I, I never really was actively pursuing this because I'm more of a move ahead sort of person. I wanted to see it come back into publication, but I'm uh -huh. really interested in what am I going to do next, not try to revive this other thing. And then Cross Crow contacted me. And they're a much smaller publish, pu publishing house. Um, but I will tell you, I'm, I have absolutely loved working with these people. Um, I've had a, a, an awesome editor. Uh, I, I pretty much have a, a author crush now on the cover designer. This is, again, the difference between... Okay, as far as cover designer, is that the cover publishers. that is for the special edition that is going to be coming it's out? It's the same artist, but no, this, this, I was, I loved this man before we even got to the special edition cover. I especially love the paperback cover. I know, <laughs> I know they really love the hardback cover. The hardback cover is cool. I do like I hardback. like it. I've seen the thing that you put out, and that is just, whoa. The paperback cover, though, is just astounding, in my opinion. <laughs> but what I loved was the process. Um, we, again, you deal with a really big publishing house, and I'm not knocking Llewellyn. I understand it's not Llewellyn. It's the fact that they are huge. Yeah. It's, it's a different ball game. You know, with, with them, it was always, they, you'd get these little, uh, and I still will. I mean, I'll still work with Llewellyn whenever I can. Uh, but you, you get a kind of a, they throw you a bone. They'll say, hey, what do you think about this cover? But they don't really care what you think about the cover. That's the cover they're going to publish. Yeah. They're saying, yeah. What do you think about the cover to make you feel good? Um, you don't really have any input. With these guys, with Cross Crow, they really wanted my input. And it was kind of different. You know, it's like it meant a lot more work on my part because I had to think about things. And well, and, the one uh, thing is like you probably weren't used to the fact that Cross Crow was considerate and oh, they yeah, were trying like, to like actually, really involve you in the process. In, in some ways, I mean, I'm not taking away from the artist himself, but in some ways, the pagan community in Dubuque, Iowa designed the cover for the paperback edition. Very cool. So the artist, um, Wick Malloway, sent me, he had these different ideas and he sent me like five different uh sketches of ideas for the cover and i'm looking at them but i know i have no artistic talent at all i will be the first to admit <laughs> no artistic talent but uh we had a open gathering coming up we have monthly get togethers where mm -hmm. it's just well, I mean, we have individual groups that do things too but uh twice a month just the whole community can get together at different locations so we had an open gathering coming up at a local coffee house. So I took my phone with all the little pictures on it uh -huh. down there. And I'm like, hey, guys, what do you think? And we passed the phone around and people gave me feedback on what they liked about this and this and this. And there was no one picture that everybody universally liked, but there were elements on each one that people liked. OK, yeah. So yeah. I went back to Wick and I told him what was said and what people liked and what they didn't like. And from that, all that feedback, he put it all together and it came back and it was like, man, we are so good. This cover <laughs> is, I mean, this cover, I think I was slightly sexually aroused when I saw this cover. It was just an amazing cover that he did. And you have Woden kind of standing there in silhouette 
not doing anything, just kind of like waiting for you to approach, you know? And then, and then there's a tree and in the tree are the two ravens. And it's just, it's an amazing cover that he's put together for this. And then the hardbound was kind of the same way. He gave me some images to choose from. Uh -huh. And I knew what I liked, but that's what I liked. So I took it to some people, friends of mine who are really, really new to paganism. I mean, under five years new to paganism. Yeah. And what do you think? And I got a totally different thing from them than what I would have picked. Um, but when I went back to WIC, I said, you know, however, these are new people. These are the people, people who have been doing things forever and ever and ever are not going to be influenced by the cover. These yeah. are the people who the cover will really influence. And so this is what I want to go with. And so he went with that. And I think that they, you know, now that I, the more I look at it, the more I think, yeah, this is a good design. It's, it's pretty cool. And speaking of design, and since I have you here and stuff, so we're going to go ahead and take this for a minute. Um, how did it come about for the collaboration to do the room deck? Well, the room deck. I've got mine too. Yeah. Hey. The Rune Deck initially, this is another one of those weird publishing sort of things. Initially, I was writing a book that I was going to call um, Through Thorpe Rediscovering the Lost Runes of England. Okay. And my concept was this book would come out and be packaged as a box set with a set of rune cards, because, you know, you, even now, you still can't find much of anything other than the Elder Guthark in most New Age stories. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what right. we're told. I mean, there's no lore anywhere about the Elder Futhark. It's really a New Age thing, um, kind of cobbled together from a bunch of old lore, but there is no rune poem that tells us. Nobody knows what the proto-germanic people thought of the runes or what these symbols meant to them mm -hmm. but it's 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 the elder futhark so everybody loves it and that's what they're doing and that's what's for sale well i'm trying to write a book with 29 runes and all you can buy are 24 of them so my idea was there would be cards with the runes that would come with it and i'd gotten a hold of my friend taryn martin who is a pagan artist and um we came up with this idea. I had lunch one day with my acquisitions editor at Llewellyn and I pitched the book and the cards and it looked like it was a go. She looked like she was really impressed with it. And so I got home and I told Taryn, let's go, let's do it. And we started working at this. This is what we were gonna make. About three months later, I got the one of the nicest rejection letters I've ever gotten. Oh. And it wasn't her fault. The acquisitions editor, she loved it. But, you know, the thing, Llewellyn's a really big company. And yeah. it's upstairs, and she tried to sell this to them. It's like they liked my book, and they actually wanted my book. But they didn't want to do the room cards this is the weirdest thing. Yeah, I that is the room weird. cards because in the 90s, Silver Ravenwolf had done a deck of room cards and they hadn't sold very well. Oh, okay. Now, you know, if they were really more involved with the community, they would have realized, well, Silver Silver Ravenwolf, the people who read Silver Ravenwolf don't do runes, and the people who do runes don't read Silver Ravenwolf. So that wasn't a good match. Yeah, that. Before. But in their minds, if Silver Ravenwolf tried to do this and it didn't sell like hotcakes, it must be a bad idea. Oh, so they yeah. rejected the cards. Okay. Well, two things happened then. Now I've got to focus on the book, but I, I told my acquisitions editor, I've got to redo this because I can't write a book on 29 runes when you can't get a set of 29 runes. Uh -huh. That's how it became a more general book on, on Saxon magic and sorcery. You know, 
Um, basically, the first half of the book is runes, but then I go into other magic. Actually, the second half of the book is called Other Magical Techniques. Um, yeah, so it would be something more salable. And yeah. at the same time, what are we going to do with these? Because Taryn had done almost all the cards at this point. And so I, I did what I do when I'm not sure what to do. I called Christopher. Christopher Penzak has been like my crutch throughout <laughs> the last decade. Very I cool. I was like, what should I do? What do you think? And he suggested, you know, self-publishing is an option. True. And Very gave true. me some pointers on that and what to avoid and what to try. And so we went on a quest for self-publishing. Um, I want to pull out a card here to show you because it's it's really kind of a cool card that was designed to because of how all this worked. So we're going to do this self-publishing. Well, we needed one extra thing because I was the guy who was telling Taryn, this is what the card, the rune means. This is kind of the, what I have as an image, you know, what you should, but you know, again, I'm not an artist. And mm -hmm. he had to render this into a work of art because yeah. each card has a rune on it the name of the rune, and then a picture to kind of remind you what the rune poem says about that particular mystery. I found it. Mm -hmm. So we had me working on it. We had Taryn. Well, we needed one more thing. We needed money. Okay. And the money, that problem was solved by my husband, who is really good at making lots and lots and lots of money. <laughs> that's kind of his magic thing it's he loves doing it i mean seriously he loves doing it um i and he because of that he handles all the finances i mean i make money Good deal too. yeah but i turned over long ago i turned over all the money stuff to him because he loves doing it i mean like we put our checkbooks together he was appalled because to me Balancing my checkbook, you know, every month the bank would send you a little statement saying, you have that much money? Well, yep. I say, that's how much money I have. Okay, well, I'll just change that number because my number never matched what they said. <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah, if, if it was like $1,000 off, I'd freak out a little bit. But if it's a couple of bucks, oh, well, I must have made a mistake. No, th this doesn't work with this man. He will sit there for eight hours tracking down a quarter. Yeah. <laughs> so he always handled the money. And I told Taryn, we've got the money, but you're going to have to ask Scott about it. And I'm not going to ask for you. You're going to have to ask him. It's got to be a contract between the two of you. Yeah. So he did. And then Scott talked to me and the only thing that passed between me and him, he said, do you think this will sell? And I said, yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think they'll sell. So they wrote up a contract and Scott loaned him the money. So that's the third party in this. So to honor this, and also, by the way, the three of us all love playing Dungeons and Dragons. Hey, for, there you go. For, for Payorth, the rune for gaming. I don't know how well this will show up, but I'm going to try. He did a card that has the three of us sitting at a table playing a game. Yep, you can see it. And, and you can tell if you know what we look like, you can tell which one's Taryn, which one's me. And then the guy who is drinking out of the drinking horn is Scott, which is kind of a joke in itself too. Um, but it's kind of a private joke. That, you know, it's, that's, that's kind of a little vanity thing of these were the three people who put together the room deck. Um, and it has sold really, really well. Um, I think the reason why it, it, it the, other than the fact that the the website was a little bit wieldy, uh, for me anyway, as far as the deck itself, have you had any retailers, any uh, New Age bookstores or anything that have maybe thought about carrying it or are you guys just going to do it all through oh, no, the website no. or anything? Or? In some of your better bookstores, I mean, not everywhere. And but I mean, yeah, Llewellyn, so we don't get it everywhere, but there's some place in Ohio that has it. I know Magical Druid has carried it, and I think they still do. Um, Aquarius Books in Kansas City carries hey, it. Hey, there you go. 
I've yeah, been, I haven't spent a long time since I've been there, but I've been there like three times. And I like that it. an awesome place. Oh, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if you are a pagan person and passing through Kansas City, you need to. It makes me almost play. have to wish that I had a, a, a chain and some handcuffs because I'd live in there. Any good pagan <laughs> store, you don't want to go home. It's like going to a festival. Mm -hmm. You get festival mm -hmm. crash because you've been there for 10 or 12 days and you come home and you go, oh, God, I'm in the real world. Uh, and they that, have done such a wonderful thing, and and you know the owners of of the place have always. One reason it's such a good place is they are, themselves are pagan, and they have done so much for the local community. The Kansas City community would not be nearly what it wasn't is that today. for a longest time where uh, Mike Nichols and his people would uh, do their thing. Didn't he have some connection with them for a long time? Not that I know of, not any special connection or anything. Okay. He knew them. I mean, yeah, because he well, he's them. up in that area, so um, I thought there were some things that he yeah, had, no, he because he, he's I'm done sure. lectures and stuff, and he's written his. Uh, I think he's written one or two books. Actually. Yeah, and I'm sure he has done things there. I mean, I'm not. Um, I'm just not aware of any anything because I don't. I didn't know. I, I heard than, somebody say that he managed it for a little bit or something well, like no, that. I don't no, know. No, no. But he, the, he has known them. As long forever, as I them. forever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've known Mike and the Chris Wells and I have known each other since the 1970s. So we're we are all very old friends. The thing that's cool about Mike was whenever I did my very first blog talk radio, well, Mike was my very first blog talk radio was interview. Really? Um, Amber and Pat knew Mike forever. And yes. Kate was or Kate was telling me about, you know him and all this stuff and every so often she got a hold of him online and i think even a couple times when i was there at pat's house that she talked to him on the phone and stuff <laughs> and i told pat that i was going to be you know doing this thing and she goes well uh, i eventually interviewed the frost there's a bunch of people that you know dr buckland and so on and so forth and she goes well uh here's his email you know give him an email and i emailed him and then he called me on the phone and then we talked and I go, would you be interested in doing this? Because the thing that I like about Mike is he's done a lot of work on the Sabbaths and things like that. Mm -hmm. And he's very, you know, tied into that. I said, you know, would you like to do an interview about the book and some other things and how you, you know, your coven and stuff like that? And he goes, okay. And he was my first interview and that was kind of the springboard. And, you know, even, you know, like I said, the times that I went to Heartland and then I think in passing, like I said, I've met little Eric. But I think you were the ghost that passed in the night a couple of times. I saw you, but I don't know if we ever actually met. Because I did meet little Eric, but I don't think I've ever actually met you face to face at Heartland. But, you know, there are so many people that were there. You know, I met Elspeth at Heartland. I've met, you know, a bunch of people. Uh, and I think the thing that's so cool is like, and this is another thing, putting this out there. That, because there for a while, another reason why. I do this is because I kind, I didn't work for them, but I got them to back the show was I did a bunch of interviews for Redwell Wiser and, you know, with Dr. Buckland's books and some other things. And I think it's cool, especially with this deck and stuff. A lot of times you can look on Amazon and, and all these other places. And like I say, you are only going to find the Elder Fus Ark. You're going to mm -hmm. find decks that cost 70 bucks that are pretty and might fall apart in a couple of years. But whenever you're looking something, because this, you know, like you said, is the room poem and the stories and everything that this goes to, this has a little bit more oomph in it because it's got something more substantial to back it. Each one of these. Well, there's, there's a thing about these rune decks that people should be aware of too. It's, it's not easy to do one, not easy at all. One thing that was very important to Taryn and I was that the, the images, everything on the room was to convey the mysteries of the runes. Mm -hmm. I mean, a rune is not a symbol. Well, it is. But the word rune literally means mystery. The, yep. the rune is the mystery behind the symbol. The symbol is just kind of like a guidepost, the, the written form of to tell you what mystery you're talking about. Um, but these are very real mysteries. These are very real things. You know, they, they are historical. Uh, and 
most of the decks that I've seen, even the Anglo-Saxon decks, there were other Anglo-Saxon decks. I haven't there seen any. any. I really good looked. good Anglo-Saxon decks. I yeah. wouldn't have bothered with this thing because <laughs> it was a real pain in the butt, you know. Yeah. But yeah. you know, like there, I found, I find, oh, this is this is a great ang oh Anglo-Saxon deck. One was published by Anglo-Saxon Books, which publishes a series of really good little Anglo-Saxon books. But I got the deck thinking, okay, yeah, I don't have to worry about this. I can just refer people to this deck. It'll be great. And then I went through it and no. Because a problem with a lot of these rune decks, there's got to be an image on it. Okay, now mm -hmm. if you get one with just the, the rune and nothing else, fine. But if they have an image on it, the problem is so often the artist depicts his or her interpretation of the runes. Mm -hmm. And this is something we work really, really hard at not doing. It's a very difficult not to do that, but we worked really hard at it. Um, the room, just for example, the room for win, for, for joy. The mystery isn't really just joy. The mystery is more like gratitude. It defines what joy is. And it says, mm -hmm. if you have this, 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 and this, you are happy. You know, yep. stop bitching, stop complaining. You are happy. Yeah. You know? So we tried to describe this in the in the image, and it's talking about a safe home. So you've got these people indoors in a shelter, you know, and they've got a table with food on it and everything. Well, Taryn thought it looked too static, and the first one did look kind of like an Egyptian hieroglyph sort of thing, you know, it was, it was very static. Mm -hmm. And he said, What if we had them eating the food? Well, I thought about it. I mean, each one of these cards took days to come up with what we're going to mm -hmm. do. I thought about it and took me, it was like the next day when I responded to him, I said, no, let's, we can't do that because there is nothing in this rune poem in this mystery about eating, about food. It's like we're putting some food there to show that they have enough. But if we have them eating, it's going to draw attention to the food. And that's not really part of the mystery. Mm -hmm. This is how hard we worked to make sure that what came through was just that mystery. Because with the idea being, if someone gets this, they're not getting a lyrics interpretation of the runes. They are getting the runes, which is mm -hmm. what I assume the person wants, that they actually want to work with the runes themselves, not my interpretation of them. And the thing about that is also like uh, whenever you messaged me the other day uh, talking about this, a lot of people, and it, it's, it does work like that. And for me, I, I do it that way too, is, you know, a, a rune or a tarot card or an ogum or whatever. It's like, it's not just the, the images and everything. And you have this pretty card, you have it there for two purposes, for the people that are more of the divinatory mindset, you can do divinations with it but the other thing and i've been trying to work with this more myself lately over the last couple of years is the meditationary side of it where mm -hmm. you can really get get in there turn this around get mm -hmm. in there and you know not just look at how they are but see how it pertains to you in your meditations and then go back i recommend people if they get this look up the room poem yes, yes. and see what it says and see how it ties into this deck because you're gonna you're gonna get the two pulled the out of it. in the little booklet don't i have the room poem in there I... so long i'm trying to remember what the hell i wrote this is this is another thing it's really difficult to do one of the most difficult things you can do is write instructions on the runes on a little teeny tiny thing that goes inside the box but um yeah, each one I give like the meaning summed up in a few words, mm -hmm. but of uh, equal importance, I give the room poem passage itself. Yes, that's and, that's the main thing yeah, of it. That's it's very, very cool. important to realize that you know the the word is just a mnemonic thing to sum up a general meaning concept sort of thing, but it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can sum up the meaning in one or two words. You That's true. Say, it's it's all encompassing. So there's a lot, there's a yes. lot to digest there. Hear people say failk means money. And it could be interpreted that way, but that's not what it means. It is an entire mystery that in certain circumstances, yes, can be translated as mm -hmm. money. 
can be interpreted as money, but it can mean a lot of different things depending on your circumstances and where you're at at the time and what rooms fall around it. So, you know, I put in little one word meanings because people expect that, especially when they're starting. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to understand the runes, the thing is to go to the original passage, the rune poem. And what is that poem saying? What is the mystery behind the rune? And, you know, with this deck, the other thing is now that you've got, now that we've been talking about this, you got me thinking, uh, you know, and, and uh, going through what you've gone through with Llewellyn and various things. Because this deck is out here, I'm going to ask you the question. Are you going to do a book that kind of can go inside, not just the little book that's here, but are you going to try to take that book that you've written or, or maybe want to redo or whatever? Are you going to try to get something put together that could augment with this? I think that would, that would be, be really cool. would be a handbook cool. of Saxon sorcery and magic. You need a handbook of Saxon. If you don't have that book, you need to get that book, Tim. The book was written at the same time we were making these cards. They were initially intended to go together as a set. Oh, but they didn't take it together. I don't have that no, yet. I no, still got to get this book. Because the first half of the book is all about runes. And we'll, it, it will discuss each one of these mysteries. And again, I don't try to tell you how to interpret it. What I try to do is kind of explain, put that the passage in context because uh -huh. a lot of people, just for example um the payorth rune that i showed you with the three of us on it mm -hmm. that particular rune in some books you will have it you'll have people say it, it, it means a chess piece okay well okay. it can't possibly mean a chess piece because chess was not known in england at the time that the Old English Rune poem was transcribed. It was not a thing. Nobody knew what chess was. So obviously that rune does not mean a chess piece. You That's know? somebody so, else's association that they yeah. wanted to put on to. Well, we go through and we talk about what these mean. And very often a lot, that's a problem with a lot of modern rune books. It's like people just kind of making up what they want it to mean with today's mindset and that may mean be what it means to you yeah but what i try to show people in the book is how that room fits into the context of the, the society that the room poems come from mm -hmm. ice the room for ice is another one people are always so many room books and individual will talk oh it means stasis it's like no there's nothing in the room poem that remotely suggests that um, and Anne Groa Sheffield was once talking to me about this, and she pointed out that uh, not in England, but in Scandinavia, where they have you know, similar runes with the younger Futhark, uh -huh. um, ice means the opposite. When winter comes and the fjords ice over, that was when most trade took place because suddenly the because you could move. Area, yeah, they had super highways. You yeah. know, and they would like transport goods up and down along the ice. So from a pre-industrial standpoint, ice is slick. Ice is fast. Ice means movement. Ice does not mean stasis. That yeah. has to do with molecular theory that these people had no idea about what that was. So yeah. you, know, you have to look at it in the context of who these people were and what does the rune poem say? Not just and, what you want it to mean. Yeah. So definitely people that you know listen to this and watch this, you should definitely go and everything that we're talking about, I'll put links, I'll put all the addresses for everything to get. But this is something that, like I say, I'm going to be doing a separate video for this and just mm -hmm. give it my own go over because I need to work with it a little bit. I've only had it for about four days, five days now. And so I want to, you know, give it a fresh look over and see how it speaks to me and stuff. But the next question before we get right. I, I do I do want to say, I like what you said about the meditation because when we designed this, this was just supposed to be a learning tool because it was going to go with the book. And yeah. So a way of learning the runes. But I have had since then so many people tell me that they really liked, um, you know, they really liked the runes, not just for divination, but as you say, as a meditative device. And also, like, I'm one of those people that also, uh, in ritual, 
you know, there's things that, you know, I think there are energies that the runes and the rune poem and meanings for certain things can add to that situation. So there's, there's many ways to utilize this. And, you know, it's, it, it's as infinite as you can, you know, come oh, yeah. up with. You it. can use it for magic. You can use it for casting spells if you want to. You know, there's a lot of ways to use there's it. A lot, there's a lot packed into this little deck of cards. It's just very, very cool. Um, well, okay, before I get to that. Okay, the, the other $364 question. Do you have anything else in the works for in the future or down the road? Maybe possibly. Yes. Yay. <laughs> That's a good thing because with this, the reason why I ask is because with this re-release coming out, you know, of this book and stuff, it's like in our last interview, you said you had some stuff coming out. And I didn't know at the time that was that until you got a hold of me and said that your publisher wanted me to get a hold of them and so forth. But it's just like I just going, yes, because it's just like the way that you reading this and I did. Now you've given me two things that I got to do because right now money's a little bit tight and I have some things that I have to watch. But around Samhain time, the floodgates of my worry are going to be passed and I'm going to have a little found cash. So okay. I'm probably going to get both of them at the same time. Because if I don't, then I won't, you know, because yeah. I'll get one because I definitely want to get this. I, I can't get the special order, but I want to get the paperback because you like okay, the paperback, paperback cover. Yeah, and you got time to save up for that because the paperback isn't supposed to come out till like February. Okay, yeah, before we go any further with this, what are the release dates for the special edition and then the release date for the actual? Well, the special book edition, is. The limited, it's a limited numbered special edition. There will only be 200 copies Ooh. and uh, and each book will be hand numbered. This is copy number blah 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 200 you signing them and do what are you signing them i'm not actually signing them but they they uh oh that would be so cross pro books they will be filling out out the numbers if i see you in person i will certainly sign your book obviously but um, very cool very cool but they uh i think they're like about 50 dollars, but it's a hard bound cover and it's you know it'll be a collector's item when they're gone they're gone yeah and it looks beautiful. They sent me, well, probably the same thing they sent. I don't know what they sent you. No, they sent me the, um, it's like the fetal book. It's, it was from the publisher themselves. They want to make sure everything was fine. So I get the cover. I get all the innards. It's not bound together. Yeah, yeah. So I was able to see everything. And and it's just absolutely beautiful. It's just a work of art. I'm, I'm really, really happy. The, about the one thing is like that they are taking orders for right now. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You've you been see. passing that link around and I'm going to put that with this. Yeah. So uh, if you want that, you need to order it because there's 200, 200 and copies gone. and you're out of luck if you don't get it. Yeah. Um, and I get five of them. So there's really, you know, yay, very cool. Copies. but like, you know, for me, one of the things that I was lucky and able to do with, uh, wiser was whenever i interviewed like mary Kay greer or i've i've interviewed authors of voodoo books and all these different things i would get sent two copies one as a review uh, of the book and then one as a copy to give away as like a contest people like if you're going to listen to the show i would have you uh, uh-huh. let me know that you wanted to maybe see about getting it there was a show where i had a retailer that was kind of a almost like a Walmart meets Azure Green kind of thing. And they go, we would like to put an athame into your show. So I did a book uh, contest type thing for people that wanted to get in on it. And uh, separate from that, we did this beautiful, it was a, actually a pretty nice athame. But mm-hmm. it's just like, the one thing that I like about a, a lot of pagan publishers, some of them are not that great. So just keep an eye out, folks. Mm-hmm. But the, you know, is you got to get a company that's not afraid to do a good print run. So I hope whenever the paperback comes out that, that they give it a good, just printing, because I think if, if this artwork that you're saying on that cover is as cool as, as I think it's going to be, it's going to sell just as good as anything, because the only other place that I really see you in neon is on Amazon. It's like all of your other than, you know, because of the fact that Llewellyn's not, publishing the other but it's like you're there and people are reading it people are you know responding and stuff like that and i think abe books abe 
And then I think I've seen, they don't sell it, but I think they kind of review. It's called a place called Goodreads. And then okay. there's another, okay. another company that's based out of the UK that I've seen a little blurb about one of your books. And I think, I think it's called Thrifty or Thrift UK. Okay. So it's like there are companies that, that see you and have seen your work and stuff like that. So here's hoping that Cross Crow and that website is www.crosscrowbooks.com. They've got other stuff. They've got Raven Digitalis. They've mm -hmm. got mm -hmm. all kinds of people. And I hope this is one of those companies that can, you know, get a little bit of a, a, a steam going with their books because, you know, it's, it's the big guys, they've got their market. They're going to have that forever. But, you know, when you've got a company that's not afraid to work with you the way that they did with you on, you know, setting up your covers and just gave you a really good feeling about doing this, those mm -hmm. are the people that I want to get because I don't want to be with somebody that's going to be like the sort of Damocles is hanging over your head because if you don't sell like Big Blue did in, back in the day or, or Starhawk or any of these other people that was basically pushing books out the door so fast they couldn't keep up, I think it's good that pagans keep up with the authors and, you know, not so worry so much about enriching these big conglomerate, you know, booksellers when you've got people like Cross Crow and Phoenix Publishing and certain divisions of Red Wheel and stuff like that, where also I've noticed, I don't know if you have either, but a lot of these smaller publishers, if you really look at their catalog of books, whether it's magic or astrology or whatever, I've noticed that it's, usually not the a sensationalized one-on-one -on -one type stuff all over the place, but you've got books and authors and things that they actually give a crap about giving you a good book. Mm -hmm. They're not worried yeah, about I was that kind of, kind of I was thing. I really know? impressed with some of the stuff that Cross Pro is putting out. You know, I mean, I had never heard of them myself, so I'm, I kind of looked at what they were doing and they are you know relatively new and small but the the people that they're getting and the titles that they're putting out are is fairly impressive and, and i don't really know what the whole process is like yet you know i love everything they have done with me so far i absolutely love these guys i think they're awesome I wish them the best. I hope everything continues to go really well. And if you have honest, anything else that comes how... out, I hope they could work with you again. If yes, once is good, yes. twice could be just I, as I good. I love working with them. You know, my concern is, as you put it, it's like how well, how will distribution work? How well will these books get distributed? Um, but, but other than that, you know, I couldn't be more pleased with them. They are, they are, they always take my feelings into consideration mm -hmm. and you don't always get that with the larger publishers that's know? true it's like they yeah. actually take the time to treat you like a person and not just uh, you know dollar signs in their eyes just out of curiosity i know they're constantly you... saying we want to make sure you're happy with what we're doing and yeah that's a I good thing been. so far i have been <laughs> because if there was a red flag or something it's like you're gonna run from that as fast as you can if there's mm -hmm. something that just kind of put you off but I know you've done this festival circuit for years and years and years and years and years, longer than I've been in a craft probably. But here's my question. With these books, just out of curiosity, have you had the, the joy and the honor of doing any like bookstore book signings at any places? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, again, Barbara was really good about that. <laughs> Actually, when Trails of Middle Earth came out, one of the coolest signings I've had. I mean, bookstores are one thing, you know, but Travis Middle Earth, I had a wonderful experience. Uh, in 2009, when it came out at the Heartland Pagan Festival, Aquarius Books always has a vendor's booth there, a mm -hmm. large tent where they, they have a lot of their products and all. And out of their own pocket, they had no reason to have to do this or anything on their own. They, uh, had a book signing party sort of thing for me there where they had cake and <laughs> punch and people were lined up and it was it was Ooh, just absolutely very cool. wonderful. And of course, anybody who bought my book while I was there. So I was just sitting there signing one book after another. And uh, you know, that was my first experience. A so part of it was it was the first time that had happened. Um, but they were just really awesome with me, and, and uh, it was a great experience doing that. 
And, you know, since then, I've done book signings at Aquarius Books and um, finding out bookstores. It's usually not bookstores where I wind up doing it. It's usually festivals, festivals yeah. where I wind up doing them. Mm -hmm. but However, I am lined up uh, Higher Self Holistics in Dubuque has already talked to me about doing two different book signings. One, whoa, uh, well, uh, one just on whatever is out now uh, okay. that they were talking about maybe sometime next month or October. Have okay, very cool. For that. And then to have me come back in February for another book signing. when Once this re-release comes out. Uh, very cool. Comes out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, you know, we're going to go ahead and get ready to wrap this up. Before we get off of here, I want to say, everybody, you need to check out Alaric's books. You need to go to his website, alaricalbertson.com. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, don't go there. Don't uh -oh, go there. You, you, what is your site now? It, I don't have one. <laughs> what so, happened? There is no website now. So don't go to that one. Oh, it went down. Yeah, basically, it just it didn't really get that much traffic, and it was a lot of work maintaining it. Okay, um, that makes sense. So I I just felt like I it was a lot of work for not much payback, and really, you know, if you want to get in contact with me, like send me a friend request on Facebook. I still have like fifteen hundred slots, so yeah. yeah, people, you can look for him on Facebook. That that's very very true. Okay, don't don't go for the website thing. Um, also, and honestly, it's like, and if you read my books and you want to friend me on Facebook and you've got a question, that's why I say this to people too, because I've been on both sides of the fence. You know, I, Paul Husson is one of my Facebook friends and I just got all, you know, like schoolgirl giddy when I found yeah, him. I, I, I friended him know? about a year ago. Yeah. Cause he was a big name when I was nobody. You Back know, in the day. Died. Yeah. Paul Husson had a lot of books. Yeah, I know what it's like to be on both sides of the fence. So if you do get my books and you like them, feel free to friend me on Facebook. And if you've got any questions or something, send me the questions. I will answer your questions. We can talk. Um, I don't write these books to get really wealthy. I already have yeah. money. And if I wanted more money, I would do something other than write books. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. not the way to Definitely get Definitely true. So, I do it because I want to help people and share with people. So do not hesitate to like friend friend me and then send questions when you have them. And you know, that's the one thing, folks, is like 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 we were talking about earlier in the interview. Like I've like I've had people from England that have left messages on my last interview with him and other people that have recently got that I've said, well, I was getting ready to do another interview. And the book that they recommended was this, you know, that, that, you know, the, the original and I go, well, oh, in about a week, I'm getting ready to interview him for the uh, re-release. And they go, oh, really? And they go, I go, well, what did you think of the book? And they go, they liked it. And I go, are you going to get the new one? And I kicked them the link for Cross Crow. I said, things aren't right now. You're going to have to wait, but you can at least keep an eye on it and see you know, because well, Alaric now gonna, you don't. Now you can order right now, and for do, this, if you want the limited edition, order it because again, two hundred two hundred copies, copies it's going to be gone. But for the paperback, you know, for putting into your library, as soon as it comes out, Alaric's going to be putting all that cross crow when we putting stuff out, things like that. I'll be putting little bits of info and stuff out about it, so everybody's going to have a chance. But the thing that I just like uh, is saying is the fact that. People are reading Alaric's books. They're getting some something out of it. And that's the thing. You know, even if there's a little kernel of something that you can grab onto, that's what makes the writer's work worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, is that the fact that something, something clicks with somebody. Not everybody's going to click on the same things, but it's there because he took the time to write this for us, folks. He took, you know, he had something that he wanted to put out. And, you know, there was the situations and the times that it did. And now people have this information available. And before we finish, I uh, also want to say congratulations on your new Kindred. Oh, thank you. Thank Very you. cool. Alaric's recently come into a group with some people in his area for a new uh, Kindred. And I think that's very, very cool. Here with us, like I said the other day, we just like recently, too bad you couldn't have made it. I would have loved yeah. to have you come down 
And, well, I was kind of hopeful and I did ask around, but it's a long drive down to Springfield from Dubuque. And I just couldn't convince anybody else to go with me. And it's, it's really just. People well, eventually sometime along. in the future, it's like, you know, we got a uh, salmon coming up. We're doing that, but you know, maybe sometime in the future, you can get somebody actually, you know, next year around Beltane, I would like to see if you would come down and, you know, be with us for Beltane and maybe be part of ritual with us. We'll have to see again. It's like, well, it just depends on what a I can busy, get other busy to do. guy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, it's like it, there are, you know, twenty years ago, I'd say, yeah, sure, no problem. But I recognize <laughs> my limits now. Yeah, you know, drive that long is just like way too hard for me to do by myself. So I, I do need somebody else to be driving. I mean. I can actually do most of the driving if there's somebody else sitting there next to me. You know, it's what I'm all and the, by the one thing, the reason why I, I'm not afraid to make the, the invite is because you know Springfield. You've been here before. It's I not do. like no, I'm inviting I, you I to go to I or something, love, you know. I mean, yeah, it's, I, I love Springfield. When there's this Springfield group, any pagan group down there in Springfield, it's like it's very likely I'm on the Facebook group. Um, I love Springfield. I always have. Um, I really want an original pizza so bad. Uh, you were saying that, yeah. Um, and I want to go to that one place on Sunshine that has the really good cashew chicken. So, oh. you know, there are reasons to come down. There spring. are reasons to come down. <laughs> so we're going to wrap this up. This book is going to be coming out soon. You need to get it. It's going to be great. I need to get both books, the book on uh, sex and sorcery and this. I'm going to get them both probably around the beginning of October so that I can really see how that. And the review for this will probably be in about a week or so because, like I said, I've got to edit this and then I've got to bring it down into the podcast form. For you people out there, this will be seen on YouTube, on Pagan Perspective. Tell your friends, pass it around, like, comment, and subscribe. For our Spotify listener, listeners, I appreciate you all so much. You need to pass this around. I've had older shows when I did the interview with Dr. Buckland and stuff. One of the things about Blog Talk Radio is you could download it onto a hard drive or a little disc or something like that. And I had people that got a hold of me and said that they were listening to my interview with Dr. Buckland. On, uh, they had burn it off on the CD. And they had a CD player in their car. So when they would go to work in the morning, they would, the various, you know, pagan and, and occult authors that had, uh, or interviewers and stuff that were on Blog Talk, they, this guy goes, yeah, I've got a little book next to me when I drive that's got these and they put it in. So it's pretty cool that whenever your podcast is listened to by, you know, people as they're driving. And I think you can pick up Spotify on these, some of these car radios now, they're like Sirius XM, they've got a, division that's attached to spotify so now people can listen to this as they drive to work which i think is very cool so check that out all the links for for cross crow will be in here uh you know uh alaric albertson facebook look him up i don't think there's anybody else on there that's him so he'll be pretty easy to get a hold of (laughs) and stuff so we've got more videos coming up here pretty soon we've got more podcasts coming up and if also, if you can, uh, and you're interested in learning something about the runes, I suggest that you go and get you a copy of this deck. Only cost me 20 something, you know, with, with tax and shipping. And it was, it's, it's something I'm really looking forward to getting into. So having said that, I want to thank everybody for taking their time to uh, listen to this. I want to appreciate, uh, I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me about this uh book Alaric and maybe down the line you might have another project that comes out that's going to be something that people will be wanting to see about and we can do it again well thanks for having me back Tim and if I have something else to show I will definitely let you know well folks that's it I hope you guys have a great week I've got to get some editing done and all that stuff so for myself and Alaric here sitting with me Blessings of the old gods, and we will see you guys on the other side. Have a good night.